trying to figure out how to cope with this uh, COVID here uh, with C Stand Up, Aaron Foster, I'm your host. Uh, I have attorney, entertainment attorney, Howard Lee, man. He's been a longtime comedy friend to an entertainment guy. I know you've done a lot of uh, records and other deals with big people, man. Uh, thank you for coming and being a part of my show. My pleasure. I actually did stand up over 35 years ago yeah. on the Oregon Trail in New York. Uh, I am a failed stand up but a successful attorney. So it works out okay. Uh, yeah, you're probably way richer than the, almost all these uh, <laughs> successful uh, uh, comedians. So oh, let's really not put money on that one, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, again, I appreciate you, man. Uh, listen, so um, can you give my people a, a, a quick synopsis of, of uh, you know, what you do and, um, you know, some of the achievements you've had so far? Sure. Happy to do it. Uh, I am, as Aaron said, an entertainment lawyer. I'm also intellectual property, which means I do copyrights and trademarks. Mm -hmm. I mean, my job is to help performers and companies protect their interests. Uh, that may mean protecting your trademark. You may not know what your trademarks are. If you've got a catchphrase, if you've got a logo, those things are probably your trademarks. Your name certainly can be a trademark. Your copyrights, we'll talk about this a little more, but you know, most, of, uh, most of the comedy community is out there creating content, creating material. You own rights in that. Uh, you get to protect it. Uh, sometimes you need the courts. Uh, it was actually, there used to be a system for comedians, specifically for comedians, back in the days of vaudeville. Yeah. Uh, there was this one booking agent. He was the, the biggest comedian booking agent in the, on vaudeville. And what comedians would do is they would write their routines down, seal them up in an envelope, give them to this agent. He would date them and put them in a vault. <clears throat> to dispute between two comics, as to who, whose joke it was, they would go to the agent, he would go into the vault, get the envelopes, open them up. If they both, if only one of them had the joke, that person got to keep using it. If they both had the joke, whoever was dated first got to keep using it. And if the other guy didn't stop, nobody would book him. It was a self-enforcing mechanism that we don't have today. Uh, now you need people, well, like me. To, uh, to step in and, and help you do stuff. Uh, I am also an educator. I teach entertainment law and music law at Cornell Law School. I teach uh, trademark law at Syracuse Law School and other things for other laws, other schools. I've been teaching just about as long as I've been practicing law, which is over 35 years now. Uh, and I love comedy, I do. I have, a, I have my own radio comedy show uh, where I play other people's material, not my own. Uh, on WRFI, Watkins Glen, Ithaca. And I've had shows in New York City. I've had shows on the New York City Board of Ed Station. Uh, I collect comedy records. That's Aaron where I first heard about you yeah. uh, decades ago when a buddy of mine from Chicago gave me one of your albums. Oh, and the LPs, I mean, way back when. Mm -hmm. and I have about 4,000 to 5,000 comedy records. As they say, I've done stand up, I've done some uh, programming for our local arts uh, theater, which I used to be on the board of. Uh, and I've done some work with the National Comedy Center in Jamestown as well. And a few other things here and there. I am, as you put it, a friend of comedy. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's the reputation that you have, and it's a big one. I know you've helped produce some guys uh, and some music acts also. So uh, am I wrong by that, or is that? Well, true? it's sort of adjacent to that. Uh, companies. Sony, Rhino, Shout Factory. Uh, when you're an entertainment lawyer, you get to meet these people. And uh, knowing that I have this background in comedy, I also have a background in children's entertainment. Uh, they've let me produce things over the years. There's a Rodney Dangerfield's greatest hits that I'm the producer of. Some of your people may know, I hope they know, a, a project we put out in the 90s called, but seriously, the American, the American Comedy Box which traced the history of American recorded comedy from 1922, give or take, to about 1993. Uh, and I programmed that, did all the selections, wrote the materials. It's one of the things I'm generally proud of. 
people can find out more about me, shameless plug coming, I, in I, my website, which is courtjesterlegal.com. Uh, Court Jester Legal, you know. Court, that doesn't do well on Zoom with a fake background, does it? Uh, courtjesterlegal.com, you can get my bio, read about what I've done in comedy and what I can do for you as a comedian. Okay, end of shameless plug. Aaron, you cut out. Hang on, let me let me raise my volume because I'm not hearing you at all. Okay, there we go. Look closer. Is that better? That's much better. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, excellent, man. So yeah, again, um, some of the stuff that I want to dive into is. Um, yeah, you talked about copywriting things. Now, right nowadays, no com uh, comics are always like stealing from each other, left and right. And because it's uh, you know because it's such a sensitive subject, uh, but yet there's no regulation on it. What happened in the past to make that uh, old system go away? And what do you think we should be able to do for the new uh, circumstances? Well, I mean, there, there is legal regulation of it. Stealing material certainly isn't new. That's why you had the vaudeville bit. I mean, the thing is, Who's on First Routine by Adam Costello? They didn't write that. That was a classic. <laughs> wow. they, they perfected it, yeah. but they didn't write it. It was a vaudeville routine that preexisted them. They, and it has happened a lot in vaudeville and later burlesque. You know, people heard material, they picked it up, and they ran with it. The Borscht Belt. I mean, I, I'm something of a student of comedy. The Borscht you know, performers would come down to the city, watch, you know, nightclub comedians or Broadway shows, go back to the uh, Catskills over the summer and, you know, steal whole bits. It just, it happened. I mean, if you've been watching the, uh, the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, you saw her husband try to create a career on Bob Newhart bits. It was unheard of. Copyright protects the uh, cre original creation of the expression of an idea. And that last phrase, expression of an idea, is really important. You know, you can have an idea, you know, uh, a boy and his dog. Well, goody. Uh, but how does that get expressed? You know, that can be Rin King Hin, that can be Lassie, that can be Old Yeller. I mean, there's lots of different ways you put that forward. Uh, if you know, and I suspect you do, the shows Gilligan's Island and The Brady Bunch. Yeah. Well, same guy created both of those, a guy named Sherwood Schwartz. Right. Sherwood's they're basically the same show, a group of disparate people thrown together by circumstances that have to learn how to survive together week after week. If you look at it, they're the same idea, but they're not the same show. So the question then becomes how different do two things have to be? Mm. You know, there are jokes, uh, you know, Take my wife, please. You know, the classic Henny Youngman line. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, if you, if all you said was, take my girlfriend, please, you know, that's probably going to, first off, the joke's probably too short to copyright, just so we're clear on that point. But that little change in it isn't going to be enough to make the second one original. You know, if you change the names of the people, that's not enough to make it original. Right. Uh, if it is, if they are substantially the same, then the, a court might view them as copy. There's been some litigation recently. Uh, Conan had an issue where somebody claimed that uh, you know, he had stolen, or he, his staff had stolen some jokes from him. And I think the guy lost the trial. I, haven't, I think Conan won that one, or they settled. Uh, but you know, there are issues. That people do make claims that certain comedy routines have been stolen. Now, yes. It's easy to, not easy, I mean, if it was easy, everybody would do it, but it's simple to switch up a joke. Yeah. You know, change the setting, change the people, you keep the same concept, but as you know as well as anybody, you know, the same concept with a punchline that you change by two words isn't gonna get the same response. It's gotta have a meter, it's gotta have a rhythm to it, it's gotta have the words have to click in the right way, or they might double over in laughter. Yeah. So it becomes the job of, well, people like me and juries and judges to figure out how close things are. Now, the, re the reality of the situation is if somebody steals a joke from you, 
you're probably not going to court. Uh, people with long memories may remember that Robert Klein, who was one of my favorite comedians, always has been, uh, had a routine 30 years ago about the Civil War chess set. The mm. Civil War. Men died. Women wept. Now you can have all the fun of the Civil War in your own home with the great new Civil War chess set. It goes on and on. Yeah. I was watching a Klein HBO special at home. And that bit comes on, and I start screaming because I'm doing the same bit in my act. Mm. I was set up at the time. And I did not steal it from him. I can assure you of that. I, it was a real commercial. Yeah. He saw it. I saw it. We have similar sensibilities when it comes to comedy, mm. although much better at it than I am. And uh, we, uh, once you look at it that way, the routine kind of writes itself. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> Copyright infringement. If you create something originally on your own without copying it from someone, that's not copyright infringement. If it's original to you. But good luck for me proving that. I assume Klein had been using the routine for a while. I, I, I certainly don't think he stole it from me. Okay. Um, but I had to stop using it because I knew people would think I had stolen it from him. Right. Uh, would he have sued me over it? Probably not. We actually knew each other, so probably not. Um, do you think because y'all knew each other, he, it's a, I'd say 10% chance that he kind of took it from you and went to TV? Oh, no, he never heard me perform it. Uh, we weren't, we weren't close. We just knew each other. Okay. But I, don't, I think there is zero chance that he stole it from me. Okay. Uh, that, that would be my assessment of the chances it would be zero. Okay. I mean, I was doing auditions, uh, audition nights and open mic nights at the comic strip and uh, places like that. Right. I, he was in the audience, I'd have known. Uh, sure, it's possible somebody uh, saw it and, and ran it by him. More likely, he saw the commercial. Well, uh, what about let's, let's, what about in this instance of like a Robin Williams, right? Now, mm -hmm. I had a chance to open up for Robin Williams one time at the Lake Shore Theater, and talking to him off stage, I realized that he just really may have had a mental illness that created that type of environment from his brain ears to his brain to his tongue. So he just rattled off stuff. Um, how would that come into play in that? Because he was often accused of stealing other people's material. I know he was once thrown up against the wall at the Holy City Zoo in San Francisco by somebody who said that he'd stolen his, his stuff. Uh, you know, friends of Williams usually take the position that you just put forward. He, he didn't know he was doing it. He just right. took everything in like a sponge and opened his mouth and out it came. And that doesn't matter. I mean, it's still copyright infringement. The most famous case about that isn't comedy, but music. Uh, George Harrison uh, wrote a song, you may know, My Sweet Lord. Okay. And the folks who control the copyright to the song, He's So Fine by the Shirelles. Okay. Saying, my sweet lord, was the same thing as, he's so fine, do lang, do lang. Yeah. Harrison's defense was pretty much, I'm George Harrison. I mean, that was his defense. I don't copy songs, I create songs. And the judge put forward the theory that, okay, you didn't mean to copy it. It was unconscious copying. But there was no question that Harrison knew he's so fine. And if you look on YouTube, you can see mashups of the two songs. They are very, if you, if you slow the pace down of he's so fine, it kind of is, my sweet Lord. Uh, and Harrison uh, got hit with a pretty big judgment and had to pay royalties every time My Sweet Lord was played, which bugged him enough that he actually went out and bought the copyright to He's So Fine, so he didn't have to pay anybody else for it. But the fact <laughs> that he didn't mean to do it uh, uh, doesn't change liability. Right. Now, what about in Carlos Mencia's circumstance? Because he's, he's currently the guy that everybody's kind of uh, looking at as like the major uh, thief of comedy, you know? People, in fact, people stop performing when he walks in the room at times and stuff like that, you know. So, and there's mashups on YouTube about the jokes that he's claimed he's, uh, well, that he claimed he wrote, but other people realize that he may have uh, stolen it. Um, and is there a, 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 con a connection to like a lightweight mental illness to these things, you know, because when you listen to this dude, especially on podcasts and stuff, because I've never had the privilege of actually interviewing him, although I've met him quite a few times. 
he believes he did not steal those jokes. Well, and I was a psych major undergrad, so I can say a little bit about uh, mental conditions, but that's not my profession. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I don't know what's in Mincia's head. I mean, I can't tell you that. Whether he just likes to put up a, a good front, and I don't want to prejudge. You know, maybe he created the jokes on his own, and they were just the same. Yeah, likely, but possible. Uh, so you know, we're, we're not going to libel anybody here today. Yeah, be, yeah, no, I'm not. I mean, it's, but, uh, I, I hope that. How do you fight against you know mentioning something and not? libeling somebody because i don't well want to i mean the, there are two things Alleged. you have to show in, yeah there are two things you have to show in a copyright infringement action okay. you have to that you own that you own the copyright in the piece and that somebody copied it and it's really it sounds simple yeah now, in reality you almost never have somebody in the room when the other guy's going oh that's a good joke i will take that and put it in my routine wow yeah, yeah they, people do that by themselves so we have a way of proving copying. Because again, if you create it yourself, it's not a copyright infringement. Even if it's word for word, uh, it's still not a copyright infringement if you created it originally. Right. So what do we look at? Well, first you gotta show you own a copyright. You know, filing copyrights for your routines, a good idea. It's not required. It is required if you're gonna sue, but you own copyright from the moment of creation, not from when you file paperwork. Copy it. Well, since we can't, we don't usually have somebody in the room watching what you're doing, we show copying two ways, with, with two factors. One, how close are the two works? Is this joke really close to that joke? Did they just switch up the location or change a nationality or something like that? Mm. And access. Can we show, with a high likelihood of probability, that the second user knew of, had access to the first work. In the George Harrison case I just talked about, it was really straightforward. He knew the song, he's so fine. And he <clears throat> knew the song, he's so fine. There was no issue about it. And then, so then the only issue is a jury deciding, are the works close enough? Jury found they were, Harrison loses, the uh, people who wrote he's so fine wins. In a, you know, in a situation like Mancius, if somebody were, motivated enough to actually bring a lawsuit, that person would have to show one, they created the original work. How would you do that? Maybe old uh, tapes of you doing the routine. Going back, if you filed a copyright registration, your copyright certificate is proof that you own it. It's at least first proof, prima, what we call prima facie evidence. Uh, if you get past that, and that's not a hard hill to get over, then you have, you pair the jokes and there's not a lot of litigation not a lot of case law as we call it uh on jokes being sued over right. it happens there are a few but jokes are very short things for the most part and you know something has to be long enough as i said take my wife please is not going to be long enough to get copyright registration in that case you know henny youngman might have been able to claim it as a trademark because people hear that and think of him, it was so central to his character, et cetera. And a trademark is a name, group of words, symbol, et cetera, that represents a source of goods or services. So if I were representing uh, Henny, you know, I would have said, you know, that's a trademark you should bring. Um, for copyright, how close are they? Uh, if, you know, if the Civil War chess that I just talked about, I don't think any jury would have had a problem saying they're really close to each other. The only problem is I know, because I was the one who did it, that I did not hear Klein's routine before I created my own. Right. So if I can show that, uh, and you know, I, there are people who knew both he and I well, who told me, yeah, you have very similar humor. Uh, and I can, could certainly show that I'd heard the, uh, the old uh, advertisement. Maybe I would win. I should, because under the law, I should but sometimes it's a problem to prove. That's interesting. Yeah. So <clears throat> does YouTube and other things like that uh, find their way into the court system now? So if I videotape my routine, put it up there on YouTube, does it negate anybody stealing jokes from me? And then I can go to court if I find that they do and say, hey, on June 10th this year, 
these guys uh, may have seen my video, but this is my joke. And they have to, you know, cease and desist or however you, you know, stop them from doing it. Bingo. Yes, it can. If somebody uh, sees your routine on YouTube, your routine on YouTube, does not give anybody license to steal it. It is still your work. You still own it. Uh, I mean, other than whatever YouTube may sneak into their user agreement, you know, that you've never read and I've never read. Uh, other than that, you own the copyright in what you put up, uh, the video and the audio. So if somebody pulls that off of YouTube and starts you know, broadcasting it or selling videos of it, uh, saying, hey, we got, we got Aaron Foster, look. Uh, yeah, you've got a really good lawsuit. And the fact that they're using your actual uh, video, your actual recording, makes proving copying all the easier. If they see it up there, instead of using yours, they go out and re-record it, well, it certainly makes it easier to show they had access to your routine when it's up there for everybody to see, as opposed to trying to track down which club they saw you in somewhere along the way. So yeah, YouTube does not deprive you of rights. What it does is it makes it easier to steal from you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, also it makes it easier for you to defend yourself, too, because I know a lot of guys, even in the Chicago scene that uh, I'm a part of, and you'll have guys who claim that they wrote something or they and uh, and the other guy has no defense to it. You know, we used to have a rule called the first one to the stage. So I, I ran into that with a friend of mine who's famous. Now, we were in the car joking. We talked about stuff. I was the host. So I went up first and I was able to use it. He got mad because he was the feature at the time. And he said, I, you know, that I infringed on his uh, joke. And I was like, dude, we made that up together in the car. How you, you know, how you, the rule is first one to the stage. Well, it wasn't good enough of a joke to continue to use anyway. But, so, uh, <laughs> you know, but when, when that happened, what would what would be the you know is there a way to legislate or uh you know argue that litigate way? it would be more litigate. Yeah, litigate. well the, as you said the reality is nobody's going to go to court over that joke yeah uh, that one joke that somebody used you see the reaction but hypothetically theoretically yeah if you wrote it together you jointly own the joke you may agree first to the stage gets to use it but legally you both get to use it you both own it Right. Uh, no. and it becomes, you know, who, who gets best known for it? And the rest of it is how the public reacts. I mean, I have, you know, as I said, I have four or 5,000 comedy records. There's a routine Flip Wilson does mm -hmm. uh, called, uh, you may know it, uh, the, the Ugly Baby. You familiar with the Ugly Baby? <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm, I might have to refresh my memory because, man, I was little when Flip Wilson was on TV. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Flip was such a great comic. Anyhow, Incredible, yeah. Uh, the, 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 uh, to make the joke, it's a longer joke. It's yeah. a story. But to make it short, there's a woman on a train with an ugly baby. There's a guy drunk sitting next to her going, yo, you've got an ugly baby. I'm so really ugly. She complains. The, uh, the conductor comes over, says, ma'am, I'm sorry. You shouldn't have to deal with this. Reseats her, comes back, says, you know, I've, I've brought you a soda and a banana for your monkey. Yeah, I remember that joke. <laughs> that, that's, that's the joke. I mean, brilliant it's not, but it gets a good laugh. Yeah. That same joke on record by three different comedians. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because, and I suspect, I haven't looked it up, but I suspect that was a vaudeville joke. Yeah. Or, you know, a, a joke that made the rounds. Right. We are a far more litigious society now. We also, everything anybody says, including what you and I are saying right now, gets recorded. Yeah, and yeah. For posterity, because we all have cameras and recording devices with us all the time. Right. It is much easier for somebody to say, hey, that's mine, uh, because you have it there. I mean, a lot of comedians, you know, are now requiring people, you know, put their cell phones in those sealed bags yeah. so they can tape their act, you know, when they went up on stage. I've, you know, had that happen to me a few times. And partly, that is so you can't walk out with their routine, put it up on YouTube, and take value away from it. Because in the comedy world, is different from the music world. The music world, people go to the show to hear you play the songs that they've already heard you play. That's what they're for. If you go to a 
comedy show and the comic only does stuff you've already heard. You go, yeah, what did I spend all this money for? I know those jokes. Right, I can listen to the record. To me, to be honest with you. I mean, I once watched and went to a George Burns concert. The people were old enough to remember George Burns. Of course, man. 45 minutes. I heard him tell every story he told, and I was on the floor anyway. Because yeah. he's one of the funniest people who ever lived. But most people think if they've heard the joke, well, that's the end of that. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Um, unless you become an icon, then they can hear you, yeah. or, or somebody that they favor, then they can hear you uh, over and over. Because I started off as a DJ at the comedy club, and so that was where I realized that these comics don't just make this up every show, every time, all the time. <laughs> you know, I was astounded the first couple of times I figured that out. Um, but I still enjoyed all of the shows, even though I would watch it nine times in a row. You know, so. if it, watching an artist do art, I mean, yeah. and a lot of people lose that because a really good comedian makes it look so easy, that's makes true. it look like they are making it up as they go along. That's that's one of my small quibbles with the marvelous Mrs. Maisel is that if you watch that, she's just up on stage making it up as she goes. She's before the show. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I don't know what I'm gonna do. Here, talk about this, and she gets up and does 45 minutes that she's making up. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> no, not very well. You could try. Not very well. No, <laughs> it's gonna be a bomb fest. In other words, a lot of the, oh, mm, oh. <laughs> that's it, man. So uh, we've actually hit our twenty-minute mark. Okay. And, and you've been incredible. Uh, I'd love, uh, you know, sooner or later, I, maybe we could get you back on. We do a follow-up on a certain topic, but you've been very generous with your time, and I want to respect that. You know what I mean? We can so, talk about trademarks next time. Yeah, that would be great. Well, oh, I mean, fun.